Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, we hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. So today we begin a brand new series called Brand New where we are looking together at what it means to live into this resurrection story that we celebrated last weekend. How, what does it mean when we trust that we are being made brand new in Christ? So I, I'm wondering today if any of you can relate to feeling sometimes um, just like this sense of unease in your body. Um, like you're just kind of coming out of your skin at times. Like you, you can't quite find a way to just kind of sit and be calm. You, you kind of have to just keep moving and keep going. There's just a sense of like in your body, something is not right. And you, you can't name it, you can't uh, point to it, but there's just this underlying sense that something is wrong or bad or scary. That there's this just impending sense of disease. Maybe you experience it as your heart races. Um, maybe you find at times that uh, your breath becomes shallow and maybe it becomes difficult to catch your breath or to really get in a deep breath. Um, maybe you find that your thoughts are just racing. They're just racing and they're cycling and you just can't seem to quiet your mind. Maybe this happens during the day for you. Maybe this happens as you're trying to fall asleep at night. Maybe it happens in the middle of the night when you wake up and you just can't turn it off. Several years ago now, I began to experience lots of these things that I've just described to you. And I had enough experience to know, to name it as anxiety and like many of you, I couldn't actually point to a situation or a circumstance in my life at the time that was causing me to just feel this inner sense of dis-ease. Uh, this feeling like I just needed to keep going, like I was running from something, like something was just kind of coming at me and I, I needed to anticipate it and figure it out. And so I did what I usually do, which is I just research the heck out of all the things. And so I am um, exercising for the first time in years. I don't like to exercise. Who actually likes to exercise? I don't know who you are. Um, and, and, but I'm reading, like, if you're feeling this sense of anxiety, you should probably move your body more. And so I start exercising and that's not helping. And I start taking magnesium because I read that that's supposed to help. And, and that's not helping. And I'm, I'm praying and I'm worshiping and I am um, taking my thoughts captive. So I'm paying attention to what I'm thinking about and I'm, I'm doing the things that I have learned and practiced over years that had worked in the past. And now all of a sudden, here I am, I'm a, a young mom with three small kids um, working and serving in ministry and I can't find a way to fix what I'm feeling. Nothing is helping, nothing is working. And one morning on a Saturday, I woke up feeling worse than I had been feeling. It wasn't like staying the same, it was progressively getting harder. And I said to my husband, Ryan, I said, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for a walk. Like, I, I think I just, I need to just go for a walk. And so I went for a walk, um, didn't help. And I came back and I don't know if you've experienced this before, but the anxiety turned into just a sense of terror. Um, like a, a panic that I had never experienced before and um, I couldn't control the tears, couldn't control my breathing, just sheer terror and panic. This had never happened to me before. And so uh, what I realized later was that I was having a panic attack for the first time. 
And the thing about panic attacks is not only are you experiencing panic and terror um, and you, you can't see or name the thing that you're afraid of, but then you're terrified because of the panic attack. So it's like a double whammy in the midst of this. And it was after that morning that I realized that I should probably ask for some help, that the things that I was doing were not actually helping. And the story that I had been telling myself was that I didn't need to go to counseling because I had already gone to counseling. It had been about 10 years. I had survived a really horrific childhood. And in my early 20s, I did the work. Why do I need to go back and do more work? I don't know what I'm going to talk about. I already talked about all the things. But I was so desperate and so scared that these panic attacks would continue, that I would have them at work, that I would have them when I was home alone with my kids. I was desperate. And so I made a phone call, and I reached out, and I made an appointment with a therapist. It was awful. I mean, one day I'll tell you the story because now it's kind of funny, but I walked in and within five minutes, I needed to get out. This person was not my person. And so I share that with you because I have encountered folks over the years who will say, "Uh, Carissa, I tried that and it it wasn't good and it didn't work. And I'm like, I know I have to, Um, we try again. And so I like got some extra courage and asked some folks that I trusted for some recommendations and found someone that I didn't want to run away from within five minutes. And the third appointment that I had with her, I sat down in the chair, and I I don't even know what we had been doing the first three sessions because there was nothing for me to talk about. But she understood what was happening even when I couldn't, which is part of the why we ask for help. And she said, okay, Carissa, I have a diagnosis for you. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry, you have a what? And she said, I have a diagnosis for you. Um, okay, I wasn't expecting that. And so, okay, what is it? And she said, you have something called post-traumatic stress disorder. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, I'm about 31 years old. She has a PhD, and this is just so outside of um, my picture of myself and my life and my experience and all the things. I said, okay, can you tell me how you arrived at this conclusion? I mean, this is the exact conversation that we had. She said, okay. So she pulls the diagnostic manual off the shelf. She opens it up. She begins to read off the list of symptoms. And as she's reading, check, check, check. And then I said some words out loud that you don't say in church. I mean, just shock and honestly scared, terrified. What does this mean? Um, If I'm vulnerable with you today, a little bit of embarrassment and shame because I just didn't, I just didn't understand. Like, what does this mean? And so this began this journey for me of um, healing and um, walking with God in the midst of anxiety and in the midst of panic and experiencing what it looks like to be made new in the midst of it. Now I share this with you today. Our stories are likely not the same, but I know that those of you who are here with us in person and those of you who are watching online at home, you carry your own stories. Many of you know what it's like to feel anxiety, what it's like to feel panic, to feel and carry the weight of depression, grief, You know, they say um, to try not to be a pastor's kid or a pastor's friend because you're likely gonna wind up the topic of a sermon. And I work really hard not to do that. I always ask permission when I share stories. Um, And so today, what what I'm gonna do now is I just have created some, um, some composites. 
Because over the years, one of the greatest honors of my life has been to walk with folks in the midst of their stories and in the midst of their suffering. And so these aren't real people, but they are true stories. Because I wonder if there's one that you're gonna hear that maybe resonates with you or maybe you can relate to on some level. So one friend, a successful business owner, he's a great leader. And most of his adult life, he has carried a pervasive sense of anxiety and the weight of depression. And sometimes he's managing that well on his own. And sometimes over the years, he's had to reach out and ask for help. And in the midst of his story, he is finding new life. He is experiencing in different ways, in different days, what it means to be made new in Christ. His story is still unfolding, but he has hope in Christ in the midst of his story now. Another friend, young mom, kiddos, overwhelm, chaos, and she just feels all the time like she's got to keep going. There always needs to be something to keep doing because if she stops, if she pauses, if she sits still long enough, it's almost like something's gonna catch up with her and she doesn't know what it is, but she's just gotta keep going, she's gotta keep running. And it's exhausting. And yet in the midst of her story, in the midst of the running, she's discovering the possibility and the reality of new life as she begins to name what she's experiencing with people that she trusts. Another friend, and this has been several over the years, who would say, Carissa, I feel guilty to even say that I'm struggling, to even acknowledge that maybe something is, is wrong or not right because my life is good. I haven't experienced the kind of suffering that others have. And so they carry it alone, often kind of pushed over here because they don't feel like it's okay to acknowledge where they're hurting. And then they discover the possibility of new life and being made new unfolding as they begin to acknowledge that their suffering, their pain, their hurts, they matter too. There's no you know, limit. Others over the years who have shared that they have given in to the cultural belief that we have that to admit and acknowledge that we are lonely or suffering or afraid or um, not okay, that, that somehow that is weakness. Um, and those folks have found hope for new life and restoration as they have um, discovered that it takes tremendous courage and strength and resilience to acknowledge where maybe they need a little bit of help or where maybe there are some things that have hurt or wounded them. And so today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a pattern that we see in the life of Jesus that helps us begin to understand that our suffering, your suffering and my suffering, it matters deeply to God. It matters deeply to God. We're also gonna understand together today that just about everyone um, is carrying some kind of secret suffering, whether we know it or not that this is really a human thing, a universal thing, um, sometimes more or less depending on the season of our life. And so this pattern that we're gonna see in the life of Jesus um, that we can choose to follow points out uh, discovering the possibility of new life, of being made new when we look to Jesus. When we lean on our people when we name our suffering in the midst of trusted community, and then when we listen to the witnesses. You see, there may be suffering. Jesus told us, in this life, you will experience suffering. 
But he didn't stop there. He said, take heart. In the midst of your suffering, whatever that looks like, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And so we're gonna look to Jesus first. We're gonna read together in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. This is the resurrected Christ speaking. So this is Jesus who has lived, he has suffered, he has died on the cross, he has been risen from the grave. This is the risen Christ speaking to his disciples. And I want you to listen for the pattern here. It's a pattern he lived, it's a pattern he's speaking about, and it's a pattern that you and I are invited to follow. He says, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The risen Christ is speaking here about a pattern he lived and it starts with suffering. The Messiah will suffer. I don't think we can talk about resurrection without also talking about the cross. Just like I don't think we can talk about the cross without also talking about resurrection. They go together. And so the cross, I think, is multifaceted in its meaning. I don't think we can identify only one meaning for the cross. I think it is just too beautifully rich and complex for our minds to even fully grasp or comprehend. But what I want to point out to you today is in the midst of my own suffering and the places where I have been hurt and I have hurt myself and I have hurt others, there are two meanings to the cross that have been helpful for me. The first is solidarity. Jesus on the cross is expressing solidarity with humankind. He became human and lived and experienced the fullness of all the things that you and I experience, all the things that we live through, suffered all the ways that we suffer. On the cross, we see God's solidarity with humankind in the midst of our suffering. And then the second thing we see is God's great compassion towards us in the midst of our suffering. Think about it. Jesus is teaching while he's still alive in his earthly ministry. And he's saying to his followers, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. And then what do we see Jesus do on the cross? We don't see him lash out in anger We don't see him repay evil with evil. We see him exhibit tremendous compassion towards those who are hurting him. We see him pray for his enemies. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so in the midst of our own suffering, in the midst of the ways that we have been harmed and in the ways that we sometimes harm ourselves and harm others, the cross reveals to us the great compassion of our heavenly father. Then in the midst of that suffering, there is love and compassion, a feeling with us. There's solidarity and there's compassion. And then we see forgiveness. We're invited to repent for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want us to dig in a little bit deeper here because these words are really important and I don't know that we always have the fullness of the meaning. So we've talked before about repent and how that really just means to change our thinking, to change our mind, to change our mind about ourselves, to change our mind about God. This word forgiveness though, there's a couple things that I wanna draw your attention to that I hope will be helpful for you in the midst of your own story. You see, forgiveness, we often think of through a 21st century lens as like um, whatever has been done doesn't matter, it's all good. And it's not that that's wrong, it's just not the full, rich, complete story. Because if we look at the original language that the scripture was written in, I wanna read to you the literal meaning of that word, forgiveness. The Greek translation is to release from bondage. To release from bondage. So if we think of sin, the best definition I've encountered is the ways that we have been harmed, the ways that we harm ourselves, the ways that we harm others. If on the cross, we experience the forgiveness 
of those things. It is the release from bondage. The ways that those things, those hurts, those wounds keep us um, stuck, keep us um, wrapped up tight in our own pain and in our own suffering, and then sometimes repeating patterns of pain and suffering, that feels like bondage. Forgiveness is release, it's freedom from that bondage. That's bigger than just, it's okay. There's something deeper there. There's something more meaningful there. The second way it's translated is freedom or deliverance as if it never happened. Can you imagine? I mean, this is, this is hope. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus is saying, for the repentance of sin, changing your mind, for the forgiveness, freedom and deliverance as if, as if you were never harmed, as if you never did the thing that harmed you and harmed others, that is the good news we have in Christ. And I think we get glimpses of it now. We get pieces and parts of it now and the fullness of it later. This is what we're seeing. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is the pattern. This is the economy of grace. The economy of grace where judgment and forgiveness are restorative. Not punitive. Restorative. Where God says, I'm just gonna keep loving you and coming after you with more love and more solidarity and more compassion until you experience the healing and the restoration that is yours. In the Old Testament, the prophets had just started to key into this idea of restorative justice with God. They would preach the consequences for the sin, for the harm that had been done and was being done oftentimes with some hyperbole. But if you read to the end, sometimes we stop because we're like, oh my gosh, this is just like rough. But if you read through to the end, the end of those books, it's God saying, and yet I'm just gonna love you and I'm gonna keep loving you and I'm gonna love you more until you can't resist my love anymore. And that love is gonna heal and restore and that forgiveness is gonna break the bondage of the things that have been done and the things that you have done. And it's gonna be freedom and it's gonna be deliverance as if it never happened. That's this restorative forgiveness and compassion that we have from God. Think of the best example we have in the scriptures of what this looks like is the prodigal son. The son never has to say or do anything. He just says, I'm ready to come back. I'm ready to come home. And what does God the Father do? He runs out and he meets him and he celebrates him and he lavishes him with more and more love. Think of a parent that you know. Might not have been your parent. Maybe it's uh, a friend. Maybe it's um, you and the way that you love your kids. But think about like a little one, okay, who lashes out at a sibling or maybe even at their parent. They've had a rough day. They come home, they lash out verbally to a sibling, they lash out physically, maybe they throw a toy at somebody or they hit someone and then they're crying and they're running off and they're feeling the guilt and the shame of the harm that they've experienced and the harm that they've participated in. And maybe they have a loving parent who sees what's really happening and says, hey, I can tell you're hurting right now and I can tell something's going on. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Can I give you a big hug? Can I sit with you? And if you're not ready for that yet, I'm just gonna wait right here. And then when you've calmed down, I'm just gonna wrap you up and I am just gonna love on you until you are calm. And I'm gonna remind you that no matter what you do and no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, I love you. And then once that kiddo is calm, then we can talk about like, hey, did something happen today? Okay. And now when you got home, what happened? Okay. And what do we maybe need to do different next time? And there are consequences for those things at times. But do you see, like this is a picture of a God who says, I am with you in solidarity and compassion and I'm just gonna keep loving you until you are fully restored 
until you are fully healed. You see, there's suffering and there's death, but then there's new life. Then we are made new. We are made brand new in Christ. First Peter chapter one, verse three through five says this, what a God we have. How fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master, Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have been given a brand new life. We've been given a brand new life and we have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future, it starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. And the day is coming. The day is coming when you'll have the fullness of it. You'll have all of it. Life healed and whole. Is this not the best verse ever? And what it's doing is it's painting a picture for us of the kingdom of God. Jesus preached over and over again, repent, change your thinking. The kingdom of God is here, it's now. And many theologians, what they um, understand about the kingdom is that it's already here and it's also not yet fully arrived. It's yes, the kingdom is here and there's more we can anticipate which means that as you and I experience the suffering that we experience as humans, there is healing and there is restoration and there is hope for us now. We get to experience and live it out now in our stories. And we're also gonna yearn for the fullness that has not yet fully arrived. It is now and also not yet. It is yes and it is and. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. This is a fresh start. This is the freedom and the deliverance that Jesus was talking about in forgiveness as if it never happened. The old is gone and the new has begun. And so in our suffering, in our pain, can we look to Jesus? Can we look to his life and his suffering and his death and his resurrection? Can we find hope in the midst of that story? Can we look to the way that he teaches us how to follow him, not only in his life and ministry, but also in the way that he faces suffering? and looks towards his own resurrection? Where might you need the hope for new life in your story today? Because you see, no matter what we're facing, no matter what the circumstances are, there is new life on the way. Over and over and over again. It doesn't always look the way we want it to. And I can tell you, it never happens when I want it to. It always comes later than I think it should but it is on the way, it is coming. And so what does it look like to work these words into our lives and into our stories? These words that Jesus gives to us. I have two suggestions that I have found to be incredibly helpful as my own story unfolds that I also see in the lives of those that I'm privileged to walk with. And I also see them modeled for us in the scriptures. And so the first one is, can we cultivate and create spaces where we lean on our people, where we lean on trusted others, where we lean on our community and we name our suffering? Spaces with people that we trust where we can say the thing out loud, the pain or the wound or the thing that we're carrying, maybe we've never said it out loud before. For whatever reason, can we create a place and a space together where with trusted people, we name our suffering? And this is not a Carissa idea. This is not even a 21st century psychology idea. Although by experience, I can tell you it helps and psychology also tells us it helps. But James is really the first one that came up with it. He was a really wise guy because in James 5, 16, he says this, make this your common practice. 
Make it a habit. Make it an everyday part of your life. Confess your sins to each other so that you can live together healed and whole. Now, did you know that there are Bible verses that get a bad rap? I mean, you would think if it's in the Bible, like, it'd be good. But there are Bible verses that have a bad rap. Some of them I struggle with too. This one, I think the bad rap that came along with it is not justified. You see, if we didn't grow up Catholic, many of us in the evangelical church would go, we don't need to confess our sins to someone else. We just need to go directly to God. We just got to talk to God about what's going on in our life. I don't think that's what James meant. Okay, so stick with me here for a moment. If we think of our sins as the ways that we have been harmed, the wounds that we carry, the pain that we carry, and also the ways that we sometimes harm and wound ourselves and others. What James is saying here is confess, name, say out loud your story, your fear, your anxiety, your sadness, your grief, the things that you're carrying. Confess and name those things with one another and to one another, that brings healing and wholeness. And it does, it's absolutely terrifying the first few times we do it. And sometimes we're not met with a helpful response. We have to use some wisdom with who we share with. Um, if you're carrying something really heavy and really hard that you've never shared, um, I might encourage you to do that the first time with a professional. Um, because they understand and know helpful ways to respond. I have been someone who has not always responded to those things in helpful ways. But there's something about naming it and saying it. And then in that moment, we become the body of Christ for one another. We become the hands and feet of Jesus. And we're able to look one another in the eyes and we're able to extend solidarity and compassion and grace and love and to say, I love you in the midst of this and I am with you in the midst of this and you are lovely and wonderful even in the midst of whatever it is. This is what happens when we lean on our people and we name our suffering. And so can we be that place for one another? Maybe you're someone that needs to name yours. Can we also be ones who, when someone takes that, oh, brave risk, because it is really scary and it is really hard to do, and they name it with us, can we do our best to meet them with unconditional love and compassion and presence? We're not there to fix. We're not there to tell them all this. We're just there. I'm with you in this. And can I just hold this with you? Can I listen? Can we be that place for one another? And then the last one is, can we create a place where we listen for the witnesses? Where we listen for the witnesses. So several months after that fun moment of a diagnosis in the chair, um, I just was doing the work of healing. And it is work. We partner with God in the work, uh, but I don't have a better way of describing it. And the anxiety and the panic started to turn into um, sadness and uh, depression and despair. And I remember in the midst of that dark season feeling like I didn't know if it was ever gonna get better. I didn't know if I was ever actually going to be okay again. I didn't know um, if I would feel joy again. I was surviving and going through the motions but it was like the lights had been turned off. And um, when you're in it, it just feels like it's gonna last for forever. And I remember saying to a trusted friend, um, one of my people that I got to lean on, I said, I just wish there was someone else who's lived my story and is on the other side of this that could tell me that this won't last forever. I wish there was someone that could tell me that this is gonna get better. I wish there was someone who knew and had lived it and is like actually okay and thriving now. And what I didn't know at the time was that I was looking for a witness. I was looking for someone who could tell me from experience that new life is on the way. Now in the scriptures, we see this. You see in the gospels and in Acts, the only ones who are sent out and told to go share the good news 
are the ones who have witnessed the resurrection. The only ones who are told, go share, go tell, are the ones who have encountered the risen Christ, who have witnessed the resurrection. And so we listen for the witnesses in the midst of our suffering. We listen to Mary, the very first individual to encounter the risen Christ. We listen to the disciples. We listen to the mothers and fathers of our faith. We listen to their stories of hurt and suffering and new life. We listen to one another. We listen for the witnesses. And then we look for the signs of new life. So several weeks ago when I was in the gospels looking through the resurrection accounts, I noticed something that I've never noticed for the first time that I think is important for us today. I could be wrong, but I don't think we have an account of someone who immediately encountered and acknowledged the risen Christ. Think about it. There were always signs first along the way. There was the stone rolled away. There was the cloth laid bare. There was the guards. There was the angel. There was the gardener. There was the individual walking along the road, having a conversation. There was the individual that they shared a meal with. And then it was after the signs of new life that the individuals encountered the resurrection, the resurrected Christ. And so I wonder for us if it would be helpful to look for signs of new life in the midst of our own stories. What are the stones? What are the linen cloths? What are the gardeners? What are the, what are the moments, the sparks of joy, the smiles, the friendship, the encouragement, the help? What are the signs in your story that new life is on the way? Now, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I, I can't always see it in my own story. I can't always see the signs of new life but we can see it for one another. And sometimes that's what we do as witnesses is we sit with compassion and with solidarity and with presence. And then we point out for one another where we see the signs that we are being made new, that new life is on the way. The worship team is gonna come out and they're gonna close us in a song today. And when we were planning this service a few weeks ago as a team, and we knew we were gonna be talking about being made new and resurrection life in the midst of suffering, um, David, our awesome production director, gave me permission to share with you that in that meeting, he said, I know the perfect song. And he shared with us that he knows what it is to live through the things that we've talked about today. And that this song has become um, meaningful to him because not only does it help him in the midst of his own suffering, but it reminds him that he can say to his community, to the people in his life, in the midst of their suffering, come with me, I know a place. I know a place where there is hope that you will be made brand new. You see, David, is a witness pointing out the signs of new life unfolding for the people around him. And so in our suffering, can we together look to Jesus and can we lean on one another and can we listen for the witnesses? I wanna read that verse to you one more time because it's just that good. What a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master Jesus, because Jesus was raised from the dead. We've been given a brand new life. We have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And that future, it starts now, it starts today. You see, God is keeping a careful watch over us and the future. And the day is coming. The day is coming when you'll have it all. Life healed and life whole. Try to just show